How would definitions of business growth and success change if entrepreneurship ventures decided that instead of scaling up, they would scale deep? Well, scaling up allows an organization to pursue fast expansion with goals of going national or global. Scaling deep lets an organization pursue enduring growth anchored to its original location. Understandably, businesses with such different goals have different impacts on the places, people, and communities they serve. In fact, in economically polarized and impoverished areas, venture capital-backed entrepreneurship that is often heralded as transformational or revitalizing might not have as positive or as lasting an impact as alternative forms of resourcing, such as ventures that make do with local resources at hand to solve local problems. You're listening to the Delve Podcast, brought to you by Delve, the thought leadership platform of the Desotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. I'm your host for this episode, Robin Fadden. Desotel Faculty of Management professor Anna Kim and her co-author, Johns Hopkins University professor Sunday Kim, studied two entrepreneurship-nurturing organizations in Detroit over eight years, revealing important differences in resourcing modes and venture growth. In their recent research paper, Going Viral or Growing Like an Oak Tree, Towards Sustainable Local Development Through Entrepreneurship, these organizations go by the pseudonyms Green and Excel. Excel is a nonprofit business accelerator organization owned by a large company headquartered in Detroit, with the explicit aspiration of, quote, turning Detroit into the next Silicon Valley within a decade. Green, on the other hand, was established as a reaction to business accelerators and actually discouraged early stage fundraising. It is an alternative for-profit business incubator whose main revenue came from renting workspaces to small businesses, upholding a mission of, quote, sustainable revitalization of Detroit. These two organizations are similar to organizations across the U.S., Canada, and other countries, and comparing them allowed the researchers to investigate far beyond ideas of conventional versus social entrepreneurship. Instead, they found that the two organizations were most critically distinguished by how they developed venture ideas and related resourcing. The reason then becomes, what are the processes of venture development for these different types of accelerators and incubators, and what are the real-world consequences for venture growth and impact? Welcome to the Delve Podcast, Professor Anna Kim and Professor Sunday Kim. As you state in your paper, venture capital-backed, high-growth entrepreneurship is popular and successful in some regions of some countries, but it doesn't always have the same impact in impoverished places. The two different organizations that you studied were successful in their missions, but did one have more impact or success than the other? What's interesting here is also the fact that both organizations, incubators, accelerators, both organizations were very much committed to uh, creating impact in Detroit. So they were both very much committed to revitalizing Detroit. So they had those local commitments and vision, but they took very different approaches. Excel very much recreating almost the uh, Silicon Valley model in Detroit and Green very much taking an alternative approach. So, you know, not borrowing uh, venture capital money, growing much more organically, using, you know, local resources, making local connections. And what we observed was that though some of the ventures were successful or more or less successful in different ways in both places, we actually saw a lot of local impact that stayed in Detroit for many years from uh, from Green, from the alternative, more locally oriented approach, which we uh, eventually called scaling deep versus scaling up because, you know, many of the scaling up ventures were actually successful with creating a lot of global impact. But what we observed over a course of many years was that many of them were also leaving Detroit. There were reasons why Detroit was not able to support this kind of growth. Well, also, there were reasons why through this process of business development, because they were very much aiming at scaling up, they were wanted to accelerate, but also they wanted to provide service or products that were creating impact in many different places. And by nature, they were actually shaping their business models into something very different, much more globally or nationally oriented than locally oriented. And that was actually having an impact on their trajectory. So that's kind of how we came up with this paper about two different approaches to entrepreneurship, you know, one much more about scaling up, the other much about scaling deep. And not necessarily one is better than the other, but they actually create different kinds of impacts uh, when it comes to scale, 
because with the scaling deed, you really create local impact in those uh, impoverished places, whereas it might be actually difficult to achieve that with scaling up, even though you may achieve other things, you may achieve different kinds of global impact. You looked at these two specific organizations, but what you found could apply to other organizations and places other than Detroit. That's right. This place, Excel, was using this approach that has become standardized and institutionalized across many different places. So what we observed in Detroit, especially in this organization, Excel, is something that's happening in many other places. A lot of these small towns or big cities or rural or urban, they're all trying to revitalize their places by turning them into next Silicon Valley, but that doesn't uh, always work. What we observed in Excel was one of the manifestations of that trend. Part of the reasons why we could make those claims was partly because we were observing the phenomena in other places, but also because we were able to see why that was happening through some kind of mechanisms. What we were seeing at Excel versus Green was that, you know, not just their uh, approaches were different, with those different approaches, their business models or ideas or even products and services were being shaped in very different ways. With the scaling deep approach, with more locally embedded approach, because you are actually, you keep working with those local partners and you keep utilizing local resources and you keep uh, making connections in those local contexts, your services and products become very, very meaningful locally, but it doesn't actually mean a lot outside of Detroit or outside of a certain neighborhood. So it actually anchors them even more deeply in the local context, whereas with Excel, with the the accelerator or the Silicon Valley model, what we were observing was that, you know, not only that they had intention to scale up more broadly and going more broadly geographically and temporally accelerating to become faster, that was also shaping their business models, services, products in certain ways that are becoming much more generic, much more potentially useful for a large number of audiences, populations across the nation or the globe, but not necessarily specific to the local context of Detroit. So there were reasons why those diverging pathways were happening also conceptually because of those mechanisms. Before publishing this paper, you already knew that the scaling up approach was fairly standardized by now, like a template for doing entrepreneurship in many different places. But you knew less about how entrepreneurs were approaching scaling deep. What did you discover? We knew that there were many different manifestations of what we observed at Excel. But what we observed in green, we didn't have a lot of confirmation about how much this was happening outside of Detroit. But after publishing this paper and also another short article in Harvard Business Review, we actually received so many emails and LinkedIn messages, social media messages from entrepreneurs around the world. We received messages from Montreal, Boston, Philadelphia, but also Hawaii, Kolkata, Ireland. And a lot of messages were actually to say that they were in different ways, but still there were a lot of entrepreneurs who were actually trying to scale deep and who were actually trying to do entrepreneurship differently in much more embedded ways in the local context without necessarily trying to accelerate or scale up in a conventional sense. So that was really interesting to us because it really confirmed in a sense that these patterns were actually also occurring in many different places and other people were seeing that in their practice. We were getting all that kind of requests and and they're telling us to research them. And that inspired us to continue this, this path. So we would love to learn more about this kind of inspirational attempts at different places of the world to scale deep in their own areas. So if there's any anybody who's listening to this podcast and interested in this approach, they should feel free to uh, contact us. Scaling deep sounds like something that people have been doing, even if they didn't necessarily know that what they were doing was called scaling deep. Could you explain what scaling deep means for the types of entrepreneurs you're addressing and the kind of growth that they're capable of or interested in? When we talk about scale in this paper, we always thought about time and space together. Although many people associate scaling up with sizing up or, you know, like scaling up geographically, we were thinking about the term in both spatially and temporally. 
So there is a spatial orientation to go broad across different geographies, but there is also a temporal orientation to uh, go faster, to accelerate, to become faster. So to achieve those geographical growth or expansion as fast as possible. And that is also related to their mode of resourcing because their financing often is a tool to accelerate the growth process. And also in doing so, they also have more pressure to speed up because when they borrow, when they finance, there is even more pressure to make that growth happen so that they can realize the return. This almost goes into a full cycle of scaling up with the spatial uh, expansion, but also temporal orientation towards speed. Scaling deep is in contrast also different both spatially and temporally. So not only that there is a spatial orientation to be fully embedded, deeply embedded in the local context, their temporal orientation is often towards the durability or the long-term embeddedness in the local context or the long-term creation of local impact rather than the speed. They probably wouldn't mind speed, but the emphasis really goes into the duration or durability or sustainability or long-term impact, not the speed. By extension, that also means that their mode of resourcing is quite different because they are very much locally embedded. Their ideas don't necessarily appeal to big investors as such, but what they can do is they can actually utilize local resources, sometimes people, sometimes abandoned kitchen spaces, sometimes, you know, community network. So we saw a lot of what we call local bricolage. They utilize what's available in their local context. And once again, that kind of goes to the full cycle because in doing so, their ideas or their product services, business models become even more and more deeply embedded in the local context. And that also gives them more motivation to continue in the long term, in the local context. But they, there isn't a lot of motivation for them to really expand geographically. So scaling deep not only involves local embeddedness spatially, but also the temporal orientation towards the long-term impact of, rather than the speed. Our paper at the core is the mutual kind of reinforcement between modes of resourcing and scaling. And we were talking about two different modes of resourcing and two, two different scalings. Venture capital financing, leads to scaling up. Scaling up calls for more venture capital investment. So there is a self-reinforcing circle there. And this local bricolage leads to scaling deep and more scaling deep leads to more local bricolage. So there's another self-reinforcement or mutual reinforcement between the modes of resourcing and scaling. What types of entrepreneurship ventures in these economically challenged places would become more successful or less successful? And really, how was success measured, depending on whether a venture was scaling up or scaling deep? So one thing we did actually in one of the tables in our paper was we actually talked about global impact and local impact separately. So I think even the word success, I think, can be kind of unpacked in these ways because we can ask how, in what ways those ventures are successful in different ways. Because as I mentioned, we had some of the scaling of ventures, you know, ventures with scaling up orientation in Detroit that were very successful in creating global impact. And there were some of the businesses, you know, even engaging in some important uh, social environmental issues. There was a business, you know, developing and installing, you know, solar panels. There were those ventures creating important impact. But often, because once again, they were more of global impact or national impact, and they were not specific to Detroit. I earlier mentioned the dynamics of many of the ventures actually eventually leaving Detroit to be relocated in New York or Silicon Valley. They would typically go to big cities where there are more human resources and financial resources are available to support this kind of growth. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a one way of creating some important impact nationally or globally, but we did not observe 
observe a lot of local impact in those scaling up ventures, whereas in many of the scaling deep ventures, we often observe the reverse. Sometimes there was some global impact generated with these ventures, sometimes especially when they share their knowledge or experiences with other ventures in different parts of the world, but often their impact through their products and services was really quite specific to Detroit, and they would create jobs or they would address issues such as the food availability issues. In Detroit, there was a venture that was addressing the issues of abandoned tires in Detroit. So a lot of ventures were addressing something very specific to Detroit, and there were impacts on people in Detroit in very, very concrete ways. Successes looked very different across these two places. In Excel, some of the firms were successful in a traditional sense meaning creating a lot of returns for the initial investors and also creating some wealth uh, to the founders, individual founders. In green, success looked more like solving locally specific problems. That's especially important in places like Detroit, where there's not a lot of government role in, in addressing some of the problems, local problems. There are not a lot of like nonprofit organizations that can uh, address some of the locally specific problems. When it comes to real sustainability in entrepreneurship, do we need different ways to measure success? Yeah, I think so. I think so. We sometimes take things for granted, you know, when it comes to whether that's the measurement of success or understanding of success. We have reasons as the public, as academics, as researchers, as entrepreneurs, as pol policymakers, there are reasons to apply more diverse sets of assumptions and measurements and understandings of what we mean by success in entrepreneurship. So I think that's uh, certainly what we try to advocate in this paper, more of diversity. We didn't want to completely say one was necessarily better than the other, but you know, we, we need more diversity. And sustainability itself can be defined at different scales. Reducing you know, carbon emission at the global level is sustainability. And at the same time, feeding or starving families in, in urban Detroit is also an issue of sustainability. So scaling up is geared towards the problems at the global level. Scaling deep could be a good complement by addressing the sustainability issues at the very local level. You're pointing out how complex sustainability is to measure and at what scopes we measure it. That said, could you give an example of an entrepreneurship venture that had a stronger local impact in a low-income area and one that had less local impact? One example that comes to my mind from Green is this organization that started with an ambition to help a lot of underrepresented food entrepreneurs in Detroit. So these are female entrepreneurs who didn't receive a lot of education, but who knew how to cook really, really nice dishes. What they did was using, again, kind of this is an example of that uh, local bricolage, so they were using this underused kitchen spaces in local churches and daycare centers. Through In those places, these uh, food entrepreneurs got access to the licensed kitchen, which is a big barrier, entry barrier for this cottage entrepreneurs. And also they linked them to the local market, local farmer's market. They linked them to uh, urban farmers in Detroit. So they were really creating this uh, collaborative collective platform. And as a result, they were able to help. They started with like 15 food entrepreneurs in the beginning. And later, they had more than 200 food entrepreneurs who were catering um, businesses or providing their products to like local grocery stores, and some of them opened their own businesses. That's one example of success in green. In Excel, there's one business that's still going on very actively, and they started with a very um, simple problem of trying to reduce the wait time for local restaurants and bars in Detroit. Through the acceleration process in this organization, that problem became really, really big. And now they are providing artificial intelligence uh, solution to reduce and control crowds in uh, sports venues, entertainment venues, and even conference venues. So they are seriously going global. They are working with a large technology company in the West Coast, and they are implementing their services in different states and even different countries. So it's very different contours of success. Mm -hmm. 
even if local projects receive accolades, which can include awards, attention, and further funding, they still aren't on the same scale of success as companies that scale up globally. Your research points out different ways of scaling, but also of measuring success along the way. I don't want to put them in the equal equal standings, though, because as you said, these global level successes get a lot of attention from a lot of people, gets recognized, gets uh, awarded and rewarded and all that. But local level successes, especially in places like Detroit, that doesn't draw a lot of positive attention from other places, they don't really get recognized. They, and they, in a sense, it's a lot more difficult job for them to create success in those places. They're different, but they're not equal. And and I think that's partly why our research led to often, you know, enthusiastic reactions or receptions or, or responses, because what we often heard, and my understanding is that there were a lot of people, you know, organizations who were already trying to take an alternative approach to entrepreneurship without calling it a scaling dip. You know, they were taking it very kind of locally embedded and long-term oriented approaches to their uh, local entrepreneurship. And what we realized from the communications uh, with them was that often they struggled to explain to funders, to the government, to policymakers, to stakeholders, to other supporting organizations that this is also a meaningful activity that creates important impact, even though they do not have all the metrics that are typically shown by those uh, successful enterprises in more conventional ways. So in a sense, you know, our humble work to, to some people, it seems that it resonated with them because it, it provided a language or uh, it provided some explanations they could actually use in their own context, when they talk to those stakeholders about how their efforts or uh, their approaches are also meaningful and can be successful in different ways. So I think it is it is very true that, you know, these are still less recognized and, and many people struggle to get support. And what's interesting here is that often these organizations don't even need a lot of support. We actually heard from people in Kansas City that there is now a grant for local entrepreneurs who are working in alternative approaches to create lasting local uh, impact. The grant is called Scale Deep Grant. And the amount of grant itself is not, not very large because often, you know, these organizations or individuals do not even require a lot of money. But, you know, with some support, often, you know, they can actually create something quite meaningful and they struggle to get the support because they struggle to explain how their approach is also a valid or meaningful way of doing entrepreneurship. I really hope that, you know, our little contribution is used in that way by many inspiring entrepreneurs in, in different localities uh, around the world. That definitely sounds like an ideal outcome of your research. Are there any other ideal outcomes of your research findings? I, I can think of two, two ways. One is essentially building on what Anna just said. What we are hoping to observe is what happened to the history of social entrepreneurship. Right. When, the, when that concept emerged in the late 1990s, there were a lot of business owners, a lot of entrepreneurs who were saying that, wait, that's what I have been doing for 50 years. We've been, we've been in social enterprise even before the term social entrepreneurship was invented. The receptions that we are getting from a lot of people here is that we've been doing that, but we didn't have that language. We didn't have that concept to legitimize, to make others understand what we do. So uh, that's one of one of our big ambitions. And the second is really, especially in terms of scaling deep, scaling up, we know how to do it. There are a lot of people doing it. A lot of researchers are doing it. The scaling deep is such an underdeveloped area. And the one way that we are describing out of green in Detroit is just one of the many ways that you can do scale deep. Hopefully we could continue this research path, unpack or unearth a lot of different ways to achieve scaling deep. And ultimately, I want that to be some reason for policymakers to think differently when they think about local development. Still, there are a lot of organizations, leaders, politicians who push for Silicon Valley style um, entrepreneurship, hoping that their Detroit become the next Silicon Valley. Hopefully, if we could continue this trajectory, we might be able to provide something, a different alternative for these policymakers.
I think I just wanted to add that, you know, continuing with the theme of providing languages for, for practice, but also for research, I think we wanted to really bring the dimension of time and space uh, into the conversations about entrepreneurship, because we often hear uh, the contrast between more commercially oriented versus socially oriented uh, entrepreneurship, so commercial versus social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship oriented towards more sustainability. At the beginning of this project, we received a lot of questions about whether we were not just contrasting more commercial versus social entrepreneurship and we had to explain many times that actually it is not empirically true because we were seeing mixed of those commercial or socially oriented intentions mixed across those both organizations and ventures incubated out of those organizations but also because even you know when we look at examples in the real world there are many examples of social entrepreneurship or sustainably oriented entrepreneurship that are also taking scaling up approaches to generate global global impact at a faster rate. And there are those entrepreneurship approaches that are much more locally embedded and uh, long-term oriented. So I think, although there can be, of course, some overlaps in practice, I think there is something conceptually quite distinct about this notion of time and space and the scaling up and scaling deep, different from the commercial versus social distinction we make in entrepreneurship. So that's, uh, that was another thing we kind of wanted to bring to the conversations in both practice and research. Professors Anna Kim and Sunday Kim intend to extend this research globally while still looking at entrepreneurship on a local scale. In fact, they've already started accumulating a list of organizations that are scaling deep in North America, Europe, and other parts of the world. One of their main goals is to shed light on the variety of ventures that are scaling deep and how. From this research comes useful insights that can be applied to many other entrepreneurs who are addressing specific local issues in economically and socially challenging places. You can find out more about this research in an article on Delve at delve.mcgill.ca. Thank you for listening to the Delve podcast, produced by Delve, the thought leadership platform of the Desotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. I've been your host for this episode, Robin Fadden. You can follow Delve McGill on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to the Delve McGill podcast on your favorite podcasting app.